Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs here in New South Wales. Our Zoom address this evening is by His Excellency Mr. Graham Fletcher, the Australian Ambassador to China. Mr. Fletcher is a very senior Australian diplomat with very substantial knowledge of China. Speaking to us from Beijing tonight, and this in fact is his fourth posting in China. In addition, he's been closely involved in China related policy in Australia, including the finalization of the China Australia Free Trade Agreement. Ambassador Flitch's topic tonight is the key issues facing China in 2021 and their significance for Australia. He'll speak to us for around half an hour, following which we'll have half an hour for questions and discussion. Please lodge your questions at any time during his address or the question and discussion that follows. Uh, experience is that we'll receive many more questions than there is time for answers, so please don't be too outraged if we don't get to your question. Without further ado, let me pass over to Ambassador Fletcher. Well, thank you, Ian, and greetings to uh, all of those online back home, uh, whether it's New South Wales, Sydney, or, or further afield. Um, today, uh, as Ian said, I'll, I'll give you an overview of current developments in China and our bilateral relationship. Uh, I've got a lot of material, uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, hopefully it will make sense. I've been here now two years in Beijing, uh, not the smoothest of sailing, I have to say, but one of the pluses is that I have a front row seat on what is uh, one of the most interesting stories unfolding today. China's transformation from the world's largest poor country to the world's largest economy Will it get there? If so, what kind of place will it be? What will it mean for us? I do not have a dull day job. So I'm going to um, just skip quickly over four areas, political, strategic, economic, and bilateral. Um, political, well, COVID certainly has been the dominant issue here for China since early last year. And after a shaky start, it's now seen as very much as a, a success story. And ironically, the virus is now seen as a foreign problem uh, that China needs to protect itself against. So it's got very tight borders uh, and it has managed to suppress the virus to the extent that there are only now sporadic outbreaks. Uh, and they've got a, quite a comprehensive uh, system for tracing and testing people. Um, and as part of the, the tight borders, visas are quite hard to get to, to come into China. For people to come to Beijing, it, you require three weeks of quarantine, and even the border with Hong Kong is effectively closed. But as we know, success is a fragile concept when you're dealing with a very infectious disease. And since late July, there's been a renewed outbreak in China of the Delta variant uh, that spread uh, to over half the provinces and has really tested their response mechanisms. Uh, so since the 20th of July, uh, they've had mass testing campaigns, uh, upwards of 100 million uh, in that five week period. Uh, all the residents of Wuhan, uh, 11 million. Uh, Nanjing and Zhangjiajie have had, uh, those cities have had two rounds of testing and Zhengzhou, they just announced the capital of Henan today will undergo its fifth round of testing. So how they, how they deal with it is essentially to test all the, the occupants of a particular locality. Uh, and they do it by, using 10 samples at once so that they, they can 10 at a time. And if they, if they get a positive, they then go back obviously and, and check those 10 to, to make sure, test them separately to see who, who, was, um, who was positive. Um, at the same time, quite targeted movement restrictions and targeted lockdowns and movement restrictions. And as a result of that, uh, since late July through to Sunday, uh, it seems now they've uh, effectively contained uh, that outbreak. No cases were reported on, on Sunday, only one case of local transmission yesterday. Um, and total number of cases during this period, 1,400 uh, of locally transmitted cases nationwide. Um, by comparison, we've had 13,000 uh, in Australia since the 16th of June. Uh, they've got quite uh, comprehensive uh, geotagging uh, using people's mobile phones. Every building you enter, um, you, you need to register. You, your mobile phone will show up where you've been and it registers that you're there. So in case th there is a, a positive case identified in that place, they know exactly who's been there uh, and can follow them up. 
So it's a great source of pride uh, for the country, their, their success, uh, at least to date, in suppressing uh, the outbreaks. Um, and there's some comparisons, unfortunately, with you know, other places that haven't been so successful. And so there's now a huge priority politically uh, for the authorities here to continue to show uh, that they can deal with it, uh, further outbreaks, including the more infectious uh, variants that are now uh, sort of circulating. And that's going to remain quite challenging because China's vaccines that have developed early on don't seem to be quite so effective uh, when it comes to Delta. Um, they're still helpful in preventing serious disease. They've, they're up to about 1.9 billion vaccinations. Uh, Bloomberg estimates that that represents 55% of the population who've had adult population are fully vaccinated and 69% one dose. And, and that on that uh, trajectory, they'll get to 80% of the population by the end of the year. Uh, back to real politics. Um, 2021 was the what's called the first centenary. Uh, centenary of the Communist Party's founding back in 1921. The second centenary is going to be 2049, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. And these two centenaries are kind of uh, have been projected as, as big milestones for, for the country in terms of uh, benchmark years for achieving certain, bench, uh, certain goals. Uh, 2021 was uh, achieving moderate prosperity um, and eliminating absolute poverty, as well as doubling the size of the economy from the, the, the point that it was first designated. Um, and it follows on from some very big celebrations in October 2019, just after I arrived uh, in this position, which was the 70th anniversary of the PRC. And the, the propaganda apparatus has been sort of working full time ever since. Uh, sort of reminding everybody of the successes uh, and there's genuine uh, pride in, in, in China's achievements over the 70 years and, and over the 100 years of the party's existence. The main themes are to celebrate uh, the party's governance, uh, the, their ability to mobilise resources, to set objectives and deliver, uh, the quality of China's civilization and culture, uh, the fact that China's international standing and, and power, its military strength is now uh, increased and is more um, evident. And of course, the wise guidance of the top leader uh, and his leadership. And so particular things that they, they celebrate and are pleased about, um, certainly the suppression of COVID, uh, space program, they've got a space station now operating, they've got a, a rover on Mars, uh, they've got aircraft carriers, they've got success at the Olympics, uh, didn't quite get the, the, the top spot in terms of number of medals, but they did very well you know, on, on a range of fronts. Things like the fast train network, I mean, they've got the, um, a very impressive um, network of high-speed trains. And there's a sense of excitement about China getting closer to the, the technology frontier. Um, the digital economy, um, autonomous vehicles, uh, clean energy, quantum computing, um, artificial intelligence, hypersonics, advanced materials, genetic engineering, semiconductors, all of these are, you know, they're investing in them, they want to excel. Uh, they're not picking and choosing, they're kind of going for the full, the full spectrum. Um, and of course, it's one thing to set goals and another to achieve them, but certainly there's a, a sense of can do that, uh, you know, they've got the, the smarts and the, the capacity to, um, you know, throw enough dollars and, and smart people at the problem, they can, they can fix it. And, you know, they would say so far so good, uh, at least in terms of where China's come uh, in the last few decades. Uh, so there's a sense of confidence, sense of triumphalism, uh, there's this phrase, the East is rising, the West is declining. Um, the first may be true, I'm not sure about the second. Um, the president's talked about uh, a watershed moment approaching in world history, great changes, great transformation unseen in a century. Uh, the media frequently uh, play up the disorder and dysfunction as they see it in, in developed countries, civil protests, scandals, and whatnot in the West. Uh, they sense changes coming, uh, they look at the Trump administration, they look at how people have dealt with COVID, uh, and now perhaps Afghanistan. And uh, they think, well, China's going to benefit from all these changes and China deserves to be the beneficiary. So what the president has called the China dream or the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation 
uh, looks closer to becoming a reality. So from the top down, sense of confidence, China is on the correct path, um, but it's also uh, coupled with a sense of embattlement. There's a tough world out there, uh, and party members especially, and the nation as a whole, need to keep struggling, keep striving, and unite firmly around the centre. Uh, so at the same time as this sense of confidence and triumphalism, we have a, a sense of a renewed emphasis on party discipline and, and political loyalty, very little tolerance for dissenting voices. Um, for example, what, what is not permitted on stage or TV, things like satire, talent shows that involve viewer voting, storylines involving time travel or magic, tattoos. Last week, a uh, new initiative to vet karaoke songs. Uh, 145 celebrity social media accounts have been closed. 1,300 celebrity fan groups have been closed. There's an actor photographed at the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo who's now being wiped from the internet. Uh, foreign tech textbooks will no longer be permitted in schools. The media here is heavily managed. All reporting about international events must come through the official news agencies. Uh, there are no direct takes from overseas sources or independently written uh, accounts of what's going on overseas. Uh, now, since 1986, when I first came to Beijing, I've been here for about 13 years on and off. Uh, and my impression is that the political atmosphere is now more strict than I've previously witnessed. And it's backed up by uh, much better technical surveillance now. So human rights conditions in the PRC have always been grim. But over the decade past, I think we can agree that they've tightened most noticeably First uh, lawyers, then bloggers, then activists, believers, and now tall poppies of any kind are vulnerable. Not to mention uh, the issues which are most prominent for us, um, Xinjiang, uh, Hong Kong, and Tibet. Yet at the same time, uh, this is occurring in a society that's increasingly sophisticated, stylish, aware, articulate, and self-assured, which is a most interesting juxtaposition Looking forward, the political calendar is now geared towards the 20th Party Congress, the Communist Party Congress that will occur late next year. And after 10 years at the top, there is now no barrier to Xi Jinping taking on a third term, uh, which would be unprecedented. There's a growing emphasis in the media on Xi Jinping's personal authority and the significance of his ideas and pronouncements. So what we saw um, previously was Xi Jinping fought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, doesn't quite roll off the tongue. There is now also Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy, uh, Xi Jinping economic thought, Xi Jinping thought on the rule of law, and Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping thought on a strong military. Uh, the media exudes confidence that China is on the correct path and that this must be pursued with vigor, loyalty, and discipline under firm party leadership. So that's politics, a very quick snapshot. Um, talking about strategic matters, China over the past decade has been moving towards commanding a greater international role. Uh, they divide the history now into three eras. In Mao Zedong's time, China stood up. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, China got rich. Uh, Xi Jinping, China becomes strong and with strength becomes, comes expectations of influence. And this more active role is seen in diplomatic activism. Uh, we did a count from the 1st of January through to the end of July the president had 50 phone calls with counterparts and participated in 10 video conferences, whereas the foreign minister had visits by 36 of his counterparts. He travelled abroad to meet another 37 and he conducted another 78 telephone and video engagements. So China is very active and present uh, engaging with world, uh, world affairs. The Belt and Road Initiative, uh, a signature initiative of, of President Xi Jinping, comprehensive program to strengthen China's global influence and presence through infrastructure projects and other lending. And other lending. An, un an un uncompromising approach to disputes, whether it's building military facilities in the South China Sea uh, to assert its claims and establish dominance, disregarding objections. Uh, in Hong Kong, we see the operation of one country, two systems has completely changed. Uh, since the introduction of the national security law in July last year. China's voice is sharper, even strident. Uh, 26th of July, commenting on a visit by Deputy Secretary of State Sherman from the United States, NFA spokesperson said uh, about the talks that China once again expressed 
strong dissatisfaction with the US side over its wrong words and deeds, urged the US side to immediately stop interfering in China's internal affairs, stop damaging the interests of China, stop crossing the red lines and playing with fire, stop seeking block confrontation under the guise of values. Uh, he urged the United States to never underestimate the strong resolution, determination, and capability of 1.4 billion Chinese people to safeguard national sovereignty, security, and development interests. The United States is the one country China takes seriously and worries about. Uh, the US has seen as China's main adversary and obstacle to achieving its ambitions. China, um, the US also functions in a certain sense as something of a model uh, for Beijing. I think early on, China was hopeful that the change of administration in Washington might yield some benefit for it, but I think they've now seen uh, the, the fundamental competitive and conflicting character of each side's objectives and agendas hasn't changed. And within the United States, China policy is one area where I think you're getting Congress a fairly uh, broad consensus. Rather than offering a respite, maybe the change of administration actually means a more effective implementation of United States agenda in company with partners than we saw previously, which may account for the more vehement tone of uh, commentary out of uh, Beijing uh, evident in recent weeks. People's Daily in late July um, talked about um, due to the continuous success of socialism with Chinese characteristics, the passive situation of socialism in competition with capitalism has been reversed to a great extent. The superiority of socialism has been manifested to a great extent. The most prominent feature of the world's unprecedented changes in the past hundred years is the East is rising and the West is declining. And China is increasingly approaching the center of the world stage. So strategic matters, you can see a lot of self-assurance, ambition also, um, and the dissenting views that we see internally is applied externally as well. And China started to employ sanctions to target critics in Western academia uh, and parliaments. Uh, they would say emulating what they've had themselves from the EU and the US. So China, I think, is driven by a sense that China has sufficient influence and economic weight that it can define the terms in which it is talked about by others, even to more trivial matters as a flag in a, in a movie uh, or a reference on a website. At the same time, China with COVID has less contact with the outside world or less direct contact with the Western world. Uh, people are just guessing that the number of expats uh, in China at the moment is probably about half of what it was uh, a couple of years ago. Visas are hard to obtain. Uh, the last, uh, since the beginning of last year, we estimate around upwards of 50 foreign journalists have left uh, for various reasons, including the three resident Australian correspondents that were here. Of those, only a handful have been replaced. Uh, the working environment for the remaining foreign journalists is very constrained. They're on a quite a short leash. Press passes are uh, renewed only for a period of months in some cases, rather than um, a year, uh, and even one year at a time is a, is a reasonably short leash. So on to economic matters, um, watching the clock, I'll try and uh, hurry on. Um, China's experienced one of the strongest recoveries of any major economy from COVID. It's now transitioning to more normal growth in line with pre-COVID levels. Uh, its economy grew year on year in the second quarter by 7.9%. But if you average it out over a two year period, there, um, it, because 2020 was a, a bit of a low base, if you use 2019 as a starting point, the average uh, the, the growth rate over two years is 5.5%, which is still not bad, not as high as it was before. Um, policy settings have tightened uh, now that last year's stimulus, measure, stimulus measures have come to an end. Uh, Deleveraging is being reinvigorated, central bank continuing to normalise monetary policy. And the drivers of growth uh, since the pandemic have been exports, demand for China's uh, products um, amid the stimulus and ongoing disruptions in other economies and investment, particularly real estate, uh, domestically. Domestic demand is, has uh, come out weaker, however, than previously. Uh, retail sales in June were 4.4% annualised, uh, rather to uh, compared to 7% uh, pre-COVID. Uh, uh, and restrained consumption may continue uh, with new efforts required to suppress uh, sporadic COVID outbreaks. Big numbers here, 20% uh, of the world's middle class living 
in China, and by Brookings estimates, it's growing by about 60 million a year. There are about 1 billion citizens here online, uh, but proportions also matter. Large wealth disparities between the regions and especially between urban and rural dwellers. Rural incomes roughly of one third of the cities, regardless of which province you look at. Uh, and for all the success in addressing poverty, uh, Li Keqiang, the Premier, said last year, around 40% of the population, that's 600 million people, uh, coping with incomes of less than 1,000 RMB a month, which is less than 50 Australian dollars a week. Overall, growth looks solid. The growth outlook remains solid, though slowing. Nonetheless, there are a number of risk factors to watch and plenty of interesting developments. And I'll just race through a couple of them. Uh, demography, uh, birth rate has halved since 1980. Uh, demographic challenge is looming larger. They now have a three-child policy, but there are a lot of people who, frankly, don't want three children or don't want any, uh, and that's that they have a demographic uh, problem looming for them. Uh, about 64% of the population live in cities, 36% in the countryside, but that urban figure includes, or well, 27% of the population don't live in the, in the area that they were registered in terms of their rural or urban household registration. So they're migrant workers, they're in the city without official residency and not the same access to health, retirement and education benefits. They've had some experiments to reform what's called the hukou system, but those, um, they're still rather piecemeal and tentative uh, and haven't altered the fundamental urban rural divide. Um, Education is highly competitive. Uh, Middle-class parents and aspirational parents all uh, investing in after-school tutoring and weekend extra classes, routine for kids to be up, you know, past my bedtime studying. Um, very profitable sector, the online tutoring game, uh, worth $100 billion until last month. Now suddenly it's a non-profit sector. New guidelines limit school homework, hours of operation, restrictions on foreign content and foreign involvement in the sector. That just... Choking off supply won't necessarily remove the demand, but a lot of uncertainty as to what comes next. And you know, talk of video games aimed at youth as being spiritual opium uh, makes people wonder if that's next. Uh, Didi Chuxing, which is China's Uber, um, had an IPO in New York, and then suddenly the authorities intervened and stopped it in its tracks. Uh, made people recall last year's last minute cancellation of Alibaba's um, listing of Ant Financial. All the fintech and other platform companies are under scrutiny. Speculation that new IPOs for Chinese companies will be steered to Hong Kong or Shanghai rather than New York. Um, the government, I think, is looking to harness huge data sets uh, that these companies have. Um, you know, until recently, decoupling was something that others were, were talking about. Now it looks as though China is doing something of its own. Uh, the parent company of TikTok, ByteDance, is, is a private company, but then the authorities purchased a 1% shareholding and took a seat on the three member board. And that's possibly to be replicated elsewhere in the tech industry. Bitcoin mining was a major activity, uh, especially in remote areas with access to electricity supplies, then the policy shifted and now it's been closed down. Uh, what was permitted, even encouraged is now out of favor. China wants to develop and launch its own digital currency with other cryptocurrencies getting out of the way. Last week, the president came back from a short break and announced a new theme of common prosperity. Uh, the state needs to strengthen the regulation and adjustment of high incomes, reasonably adjust excessive incomes, and encourage high income earners and enterprises to give back more to society. What does that mean? Uh, we need to wait and see. Something on climate change. Uh, China has, a, has announced a target of uh, peaking its carbon emissions in 2030 and eliminating, or sorry, getting to net zero. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2060. Uh, we don't think the 2030 target will be too difficult to achieve. In fact, it might get there by about 2025 under cu current settings. Uh, 2060 will be a different story uh, and will require major restructuring, um, including uh, you know, major areas like construction. Um, people inside the system tell us this this is a serious goal, it's not just talk, uh, and they're starting to have to adjust their business plan as a result. National Carbon Emissions Trading Scheme began uh, middle of July. Uh, at the moment, it only covers power generation, uh, still early days, uh, there's no hard cap on emissions. Uh, it's only mainly looking to reduce the carbon intensity of electricity production, but it's a start uh, and 
they will uh, keep working on, on that area. Um, now moving to bilateral, which is perhaps what I spend much time uh, working on. Uh, as you'll know, the bilateral relationship between Australia, Australia and China is under considerable strain at present. A series of actions and reactions over recent years coming to a head last year, where China's taken steps to reduce Australian trade. Uh, Anti-dumping measures have stopped uh, our exports of barley and wine. There are two WTO cases lodged by Australia on those products, and China has also lodged one on uh, anti-dump decisions affecting some steel products. Other disruption from late last year has affected our coal, timber, meat, and seafood. The overall value volume of trade or the value of trade has held up um, reasonably well because iron ore is such a big part of it and in volume and price, uh, there's been a spike in prices as you know. But if you take iron ore out and look at the first five months of this year compared to 2020 uh, merchandise, exports from Australia are down around a third, 34%. Um, our services exports, of course, uh, mainly education and tourism have also been affected uh, by COVID travel restrictions. Though, you know, good on the Chinese students, there's 62% of uh, all the Chinese visa holders are still studying offshore. Um, so that's about 89,000 um, students. Good on them for, for sticking to it. Uh, we've seen a slowing in Chinese investment, uh, consistent with reduced Chinese investment to other places, but there's also some bilateral um, considerations influencing that, I think. Uh, the normal tempo of our contact with China has been reduced. Uh, we haven't had ministerial level uh, meetings or calls since early last year, though the embassies in both capitals are very busy, uh, I, I can assure you, in communicating at a working level. Um, in the media here, we have a, a bit of a campaign of negative coverage of Australia, objecting to what we've said and done, uh, but also picking up and amplifying negative stories about Australia, whether it's um, uh, things to do with Afghanistan, Indigenous issues, even you know, the story about some poor behaviour by athletes returning from Tokyo uh, generated a video clip which got around 17 million views, and everyone we we encounter uh, has got the memo and Australian business residents in China, the expatriates are noticing uh, the effects as well. Broadly speaking, we're dealing with a China that's bigger, uh, more ambitious, more demanding, um, and it's a, a negotiation process to define the parameters of how we will deal with each other, uh, where the relationship will, will, will go. Um, we're not the only ones doing this. Uh, a lot of other countries are involved in a similar process, but it seems that we're at the forefront of it. In summary, we're saying to China that we are entitled to set the boundaries for foreign activity in our country, whether it's investment, political donations or other similar activity. We're entitled to guard against potential vulnerabilities, including in critical infrastructure. Um, and we will express our views on international affairs and developments of concern to our, our people, whether it's that happens to be Hong Kong or Xinjiang. We want international dealings, including trade to operate according to agreed rules. We want our region to be one where all countries have space to make their own choices without coercion. And we want to maintain and develop a relationship with China based on shared interests that works for both, that is mutually beneficial. And it seems that the response that we're getting is, well, no, you can't have it both ways. You're getting your security from the United States, you want to get prosperity from China. Your domestic measures uh, reflect anti-China hostility and bias. You need to face facts about China's rise. Uh, the state of the relationship is Australia's fault. Uh, further consequences will be your responsibility. On the 6th of July, Foreign Ministry spokesperson said, we will not allow any country to reap benefits from doing business with China while groundlessly accusing and smearing China and undermining China's core interests based on ideology, i.e., Smooth trade depends on not upsetting Beijing. We want a relationship that's predictable, that works to the advantage of both sides, builds prosperity, contributes to a more stable and secure region. Foreign Minister Payne said on the 5th of August, we're following a clear strategy informed by clear objectives and principles. We seek a relationship that serves the interests of both countries in which each respects the other's interests, consistent with our values and our sovereignty. She went on to say that Australia will continue to look for a constructive path forward 
working with China where we are able to do so as a partner. We're quite happy, end quote, we're quite happy to discuss our differences with China without preconditions, but China is not at present, uh, and in the meantime, is shutting down various aspects of our relationship to put pressure on us to compromise. Uh, unfortunately for China, these measures are not having the desired impact uh, in terms of policy outcomes. Certainly they're disruptive and they're causing hardship to individuals and to uh, companies, but on a macro level, our economy is managing and is able to adjust. Some sectors are able to diversify, though often with lower returns. Uh, first half of 2021 over 2020, our barley trade to China was down 100% but globally up 80%. Um, copper ore and concentrates were down almost 100%, but globally up 5%. Coal was down 100%, globally a reduction of 22 and 8%, and if you're looking at metallurgical or thermal coal, but broadly speaking, global export volumes were um, stable, uh, down just 5%. This situation is deeply uh, unwelcome and regrettable, um, but we don't envisage any quick or easy fix. Uh, so it would be prudent for uh, Australian business and others to factor in an extended period of difficulty, uh, there is potential for further disruption. So for the time being, our watchwords remain to, be, to stay steady, uh, calm and determined, to be patient, demonstrate good faith, reminding our counterparts here of what we have achieved and what is still possible, and remaining alert to such opportunities as may arise, hoping that in the medium to long term, the respective interests and attributes which enable this relationship to develop so well, I uh, will again be committed to operate unhindered. Now, I know I haven't answered the question. Uh, turning back to China, will China achieve its dreams? It's hard to say. My best guess is a combination of yes and no. Um, yes, it will become the largest economy, but I think there's less certainty about it becoming the leading economy, uh, which is, I think, where it wants to get to. Uh, because the successful path forward for China will become increasingly narrow and perhaps uneven and bumpy as well. Modern societies are complicated things and for a society to reach its full potential, it's not enough just to have the capital and the technology, what you could say, the hardware. You also need to develop suitable software, institutions, social frameworks, uh, which are more tricky. Um, and China's not the only player in this game. It's not the only chess piece on the board. I think we'll see quite a bit of muddling through and adapting to realities along the way. Very quick skip through. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Let's hand over straight away to our questions moderator, if you're ready for them. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, initially, I think the first question, uh, it's a question we've been getting quite a bit uh, on the chat, is about Afghanistan. Um, and if you could comment as to uh, how China is viewing the situation in Afghanistan and potentially uh, any cooperation it might have with other countries involved. Yeah, look, a very topical question. Um, China has a border with Afghanistan uh, and no doubt is quite concerned about uh, the situation there. Uh, I mean, the, the, the media is blaming the United States and, and seeking to take it, you know, make a bit of political mileage out of the fact that the US um, has not achieved what it may have wanted to. Um, but, you know, China is a bordering state and, and needs to deal with uh, this change of reality. Um, they're pragmatic. They will deal with who they have to their top priority will be to ensure that China's own um, interests are protected against, um, especially the infiltration of any, any extremists or extremism, whether deliberately or inadvertently um, from Afghanistan as, it, um, as time goes on. Uh, so that certainly offers, I mean, China's interests, the US, Russia, there are many countries that have the same interests. Uh, so I'm sure there will be some serious talking behind the scenes uh, between Beijing and its neighbours uh, in that particular region, but also other countries involved. Um, it, it would prefer, 
I'm sure that the United States, heading away now, but you know, you deal with what you've got, and China will, as it has previously, it, it will make the best of the situation. Um, and in their own way, uh, they would like to contribute to a, a stable um, future for Afghanistan. I don't know whether that will be feasible. Uh, nobody really knows what kind of um, what what's going to happen there in the ensuing weeks and months. Thank you so much. Um, I just remind uh, participants that they can submit questions through the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we have had a large number of questions, so as Ian flagged at the start of the meeting, uh, we unfortunately won't be able to get through them all tonight, uh, but we'll endeavour to try and get through as many as we can. Uh, our next question, staying in the region, um, asks, uh, how does the reported partnership between China and Pakistan affect Australia's international trade and industrial future? Australia's internet industrial industrial trade. I, I'm not sure it has much of an impact at all. I mean, China, uh, Pakistan is a is a, again a neighbour of China and an important neighbour for China in the subcontinent, especially. Um, you know, China views every bilateral relationship on its own and tries to make the most of of that relationship and it's had uh you know pakistan is a very important part of the belt and road and if china is able to um get resources from the middle east by sea up through pakistan and avoid being so dependent on the route through the malacca straits then certainly you'll do so that's not straightforward uh, the geography for one thing uh and politics for another um you know, there have been a couple of incidents, uh, terrorist incidents in Pakistan recently. Um, so, but, you know, China's a, a big place and, and it will look to uh, make use of all the channels and avenues that it can. So, you know, you'd have to say of, of China's international partnerships, uh, the one with Pakistan uh, is probably the strongest and, and most durable. Um, it's got close links with a number of other neighboring, neighbor, of its neighboring countries. And at the moment, its ties with Russia are, are very good as well. But uh, with Pakistan, there, there's a lot of um, history there. Fantastic. Uh, our next question is about uh, leadership in China. Uh, so it, go it goes, do you think that China has solved its leadership transition problem? Uh, that is faced throughout history? Well, that's, that's a delicate question. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure in my current role I, I ought to answer that. Okay, uh, our next question then goes to uh, an impact of, uh, I, uh, goes to Australian iron ore uh, exports. Um, is China likely to reduce uh, exports uh, relating to that commodity as they have from other commodities? Uh, look, I'm sure if they could, they would have. Um, but, you know, China's a pragmatic place. Um, Australia's got the closest, best iron ore supplies available. Um, in theory, China does not want to be too dependent on any single supplier. Uh, and, you know, if, if they could find alternative suppliers to Australia, uh, uh, then they would, um, and maybe they will, um, but not quickly. And even then, will there be the quantity and will it be worthwhile in terms of price? Um, I don't think we will be displaced as, a, as an important supplier, even if they find other um, sources of supply, which I think they are looking for. That said, I mean, China will not necessarily always need a billion tonnes of steel every year, um, and it won't necessarily need it all from iron ore either, and there are other ways you can produce it. Uh, and there are climate um, requirements that China has set itself. So there are a lot of, a lot of factors in that complex picture going forward. Uh, there's talk and then there's action. Um, I think 
we ought not to be misled by the talk, uh, look at the action uh, and recognise that uh, there are economic realities that China needs to take account of. Uh, and following on from that, uh, our next question uh, is about uh, China's environmental policy. Um, and it asks, are there any likely implications uh, for Australia of China's implementation of a local carbon market? Uh, well, to the extent that it assists China in um, reducing its emissions, yes, it's, it's a good thing for, for everybody. Um, and, you know, there's, there's an important meeting happening in Glasgow in a couple of months' time. Uh, the world climate needs world action, and a country like China, although it is a developing country and it insists on its prerogatives uh, in that respect, it is also the world's largest emitter and, and you know the fact is uh, it, th that's a fact and and it, and it has to be uh, part of the solution um, now I think we are all everyone is hoping that somebody uh, is going to uh, make some breakthroughs when it comes to energy um, and I'm hoping China will be part of that I mean they, they're putting a lot of effort into it uh, it's a big uh, priority for them, uh, and the, the world will benefit if if they can achieve progress on that front. Uh, but they're, you know, it's not all dependent on them, they're, but they're an important player. Fantastic. Uh, for the next question, I might summarise a couple of questions that we've we've had coming through about basically what it's like day to day to be in the embassy uh, in Beijing. Um, the questions. Uh, essentially ask, what is it like uh, serving in Beijing and how have you been greeted by other people uh, in China, both in other embassies uh, and within uh, the Chinese apparatus? Uh, well, I have to say, it, um, it's actually delightful uh, being here working. Uh, China is a, it's a very safe place in terms of the virus. Uh, we haven't had one day of lockdown um, throughout. Uh, now we're, we're operating under, uh, we're just coming out of a, a period of uh, sporadic outbreaks, which included a handful of cases in Beijing. And as a result, the foreign ministry is not meeting in person. Uh, and so there's, there's a little bit of, a, there's still a, a limit on, on events. So I think if an event is includes over a hundred people, uh, it, you have to have it outside rather than inside a hotel facility or a convention center. So that's a, a bit of an impediment. Um, I mean, we, we, we have been able to travel. Uh, we uh, went down to Shanghai uh, about a month and a half ago. I was in Shandong a bit before that. Um, you know, there's a lot going on between Australia and China, even without, you know, people moving between the two countries there, uh, you know, we, we follow up business uh, opportunities. We talk to, to people that are involved in the relationship in one way or another. Um, there's, there's a lot, it's quite a bit of activity. Uh, among the embassy community, there, there, there's always been a lot of tic-tacking. I mean, China's an interesting and complicated place. Uh, and sometimes it, it helps to swap notes with other people that are, that are doing similar work. Um, and I, you know, that, that still happens um, and, and perhaps happens more with COVID than, than, than previously. Um, so yeah, I mean, our, our activity has made some adjustments. We you know, talk to you on Zoom. We, we do a bit more of that than, than previously, um, but you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, the only thing that stopped has, has been in-person travel uh, between Australia and China. Virtually everything else has continued. Fantastic. Uh, changing gears a little bit, our next question goes to uh, the economy in China. Uh, so it asks, what happened to the Great Wall of Debt? Does it still exist? Uh, and what are the chances that it will, it will unwind smoothly? Or does it hold the potential for substantial economic and political disruption? Yeah, look, there, there is a lot of debt. Um, I think the end of last year was 270% of GDP, which is about double what it had been in 2008. Um, look, they, they know it's there, uh, and they've seen what happens to other places when it's not handled well. Um, and basically, the short answer is we think they can deal with it. 
Yeah, it's look. It, financial uh, problems are possible, um, and you could envisage, you know, things getting out of hand. The trouble is that everyone's been telling them for twenty years that this is about to hit them, um, and they are slowly but surely positioning themselves that they can deal with it. Uh, and the, I'm not an expert, but I I did ask the experts this very question. Um, and I've got their detailed response if you want me to read it out, but essentially we think they'll be able to deal with it. And, and, and the central bankers in Australia and elsewhere um, are not nervous about a financial crisis here. Great. Uh, our next question uh, is about uh, Chinese business uh, and in particular international supply chains. Uh, it asks, uh, what do you see as China's role uh, in addressing uh, global issues uh, revolving around ending modern slavery? What do I see China's role? Um, well, we know what we want China to do, and that is uh, allow the uh, UN High Commission for uh, Human Rights to visit Xinjiang uh, and have a full and unfettered visit. And that's something that we and a number of other governments have been urging China to do. There is a discussion uh, that China is having directly with the, the uh, High Commissioner. And uh, uh, so far, they've said they haven't come to an agreement. Uh, but we, give, uh, our view is, given the uh, credible reports of serious uh, human rights abuses in Xinjiang, uh, that opening up to a visit by the High Commissioner and scrutiny of, by the international community is really the only way to, to sort out the, the, uh, the complete uh, mismatch of, of opinions on this. Now, China says everything I've just said is complete nonsense and the fabrication. Um, and we, we don't accept that. We think there are sufficient, sufficient credible reports to, to suggest that there, there's some uh, bad things happening uh, which need to be addressed. Now, governments around the world uh, have responded in different ways. Australia has a uh, Modern Safety Act uh, passed in 2018, uh, which imposes a requirement on companies, I think, with a turnover of $100 million to um, investigate and, and publicise their, their own uh, supply chain issues. I know there's uh, some been uh, some work in Parliament recently uh, in the Senate. There's been a committee uh, published a report that's been given to the government and the government will consider it and respond in due course. Um, Great. Uh, our next question uh, is about wealth crackdowns uh, in China. Uh, and it asks whether they will have any particular impact on uh, technology industries and the upscaling of technology within China. And what was the first word? Uh, uh, wealth crackdowns. Wealth crackdown. So I don't know. The common prosperity, I think, all the tech. All the tech. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, look, I kind of hinted at that, I think, in, in my presentation. Um, there's a bit of a, a top-down, let's fix a problem by, by working at the end of it rather than looking at the beginning. Uh, and sometimes they focus on results and try and prescribe, this is the result we want to get to without looking through the whole um, supply chain of how, do you, how does that result come about and what's the best way to, to nudge things in the direction you want. Look, China's been... Um, partly because it's, it's closed itself off uh, from the world internet, um, has you know, got its own things, uh, which are quite interesting. Um, a number of companies have, you know, WeChat and, and whatnot, and, and products, um, very successful, innovative and dynamic, and, and some of them are, uh, are now available to the world as well. At the same time, China is seeking to adjust the settings of, of how these companies operate. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, well, nobody really knows when, when you make certain interventions, whether it's putting, you know, buying a 1% uh, shareholding and putting in a, 
board member Rory, and um, taking action uh, in relation to Alibaba, et cetera. So what, what impact is that going to have on not only that entity, but other people who are in the, in the industry? Um, a lot of people here, smart, dynamic, you know, doing things. Uh, it's not going to shut everything off, but but how how does it influence? And frankly, nobody knows. Um, you, you know, we all know in public policy, you you move, you make interventions, you you introduce a measure, uh, and then you have to wait and see how what impact does it have. And 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 usually there are there are knock on effects that, that you may not have predicted. And then you know, in our system at least, we have a review and then we make adjustments. Um, China in its own way will probably do the same, but again, China's set of objectives and, and priorities is not necessarily the same as ours. Uh, and uh, it may well be that, that in the, the center here, there's a different hierarchy of interests uh, and, and values, if you like, and objectives to, to the one that we would see as, as most beneficial. Um, so time will tell. I mean, it's it's a very uh, you know the, the kind of measures that, that I was talking about. I mean, this entertainment industry, that social media, uh, public discourse, technology. There's a, there's a nexus there of, of dynamism and innovation, um, which I don't understand, but I can observe the results of. Um, and you think, well, when you when you when you move some of those pieces around or, or change the settings, what impact is going to have? And, and will it will it still deliver the kind of results you want? Um, and, you know, China quite clear when the president talks about 2049, he wants a China which is you know, strong, prosperous, powerful, beautiful, democratic, harmonious, you know, all the, all the words that you can think of. And I kind of, you know, in my shorthand way, say he wants sort of California on steroids. And that's what China wants. They, they want to have the full deal, the full package. Uh, and they think they can have it all. Um, but, you know, human life is not so simple um, and societies aren't so simple either. Um, and can you do it with a, a political structure which looks very similar to one that, that was there decades ago uh, and which still takes seriously some of these things which, um, you know, in our system we think are, are not so necessary. But anyway, I won't go any further. You know what I mean? Um, Time will tell. They think they can get there. They think, you know, the, the, the Chinese way of, of taking Western uh, concepts like Marxism um, and adapting them to local conditions in China has been so, so successful that the success will continue to deliver. Uh, and I'd say this movie has a long way to run um, and we don't know yet. Uh, I'm going to combine uh, a number of questions here in the next one, um, but generally we've had a, had a number of questions that relate to uh, the uh, lack of high level official engagement between China and Australia. Uh, and the question, one of the, our questions asks, what can Australia do uh, to encourage China back to dialogue? Um, is there anything we can do other than waiting it out? Uh, another question asks whether the regional comprehensive economic partnership uh, might change um, the situation at all. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, that, that, the second one's easy. The answer is no. Um, it's a trade agreement uh, and it will help trade um, and business do their thing, uh, but in and of itself, it doesn't do anything for us. Look, the, the, the simple answer is um, China is demanding things from Australia which are uh, impossible for us to deliver. So, you know, we could, we could compromise on some things which are very important and China would, would relinquish immediately, uh, no doubt. Uh, but, you know, some things can't be compromised. Um, and if you look back at the, the list of 14 things that China gave to, to our media uh, last year, you'll know what I mean. Um, Look, just because there's no dialogue doesn't mean we're not talking. Uh, there is uh, a lot of communication between Australia and China. It happens through my team here, through myself. Uh, they look very carefully every time our government says anything. Um, 
and they respond and react to it. So it's not as though we're, we're not talking to each other. It's we're not engaging in the way that we want to and that China normally would like to. It's, it's a bit ironic that China is you know, asking the United States to do for it what it's not prepared to do for us, but we, we won't go there. Um, so we are communicating. Uh, China's probably thinking it can wait, and, and we certainly know that we can wait. So it, it's going to be a, an extended period, I think, before um, we get back to where we want to be. Uh, in the meantime, it's not as though everything stopped. It certainly hasn't. Um, we're, we're talking to them. We're telling them what we think. We're responding to them. Um, and we're doing things, uh, as, as two countries do. Uh, our next question is about the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, there's been some comment in the media recently that the Belt and Road Initiative is faltering in its pace. Um, do you agree with that assessment? And how committed do you think China is to pursuing it? Uh, look, I think Belt and Road at the beginning was, was applied to all kinds of things. Uh, and now I think they're being a bit more careful uh, not to, you know, originally there was a map actually which showed which, which countries are in the Belt and Road and which aren't. And then it kind of went viral and everywhere was part of it, at least in theory. But they're, they're being a bit more selective. Uh, I think the, I read somewhere that the average size of Belt and Road projects now is about half of what it was. Um, a few years ago. Uh, I think they, they recognise the, the danger in having projects that aren't uh, seen as successful, um, so they're a bit more careful. Um, so it's still very much alive, uh, and those countries that are part of the, the network, um, I think would say they're, you know, it is very active, uh, because China is very good at um, making use of um, slogans and, and, and kind of badges on things to, to keep pushing uh, their agenda. So I think for those within the zone, uh, it's very much um, alive and kicking and, and, and doing things. But I think at the same time, China has been a, a bit more careful not to put the badge on, on, onto things which it isn't confident will be worthwhile. Uh, you know, there's a, it's doing a lot of work in ASEAN still. Uh, there's a railway in, in, in Indonesia um, and there are various other projects which are still happening, but they haven't yet uh, been completed. So I think China is perhaps a bit wary of, of um, uh, kind of the brand getting tarnished if it's, if it's not seen to be delivering. Uh, great. Now, our final question tonight, uh, I'm summarising a, a number of questions here, but it's been uh, quite uh, a topic of quite a lot of interest to our audience. Um, how should Australia be looking at the situation in Taiwan and how should we be evaluating China's uh, position in relation to it? Yeah, look, uh, uh, a big uh, question. Um, look, Australia has a one China policy. We don't recognise uh, Taiwan as being a, a separate state. Uh, the, but the, the, what you really mean is uh, what's going to happen there. Um, China doesn't regard the status quo as good enough for the long term. Uh, we think it is good enough because the alternatives are either too hard or too, too awful to contemplate. Uh, and so it is a that is why we, we urge on both sides restraint uh, and uh, whatever happens between the two uh, in future ought to be uh, handled through negotiation uh, and through uh, dialogue and, and not through resort to force. Thank you very much, Graham. And thank you to our audience for a very stimulating range of questions which have generated some fascinating answers. Um, Next week, uh, we'll be issuing another edition of our regular publication columns from Glover Cottages, in which we recommend articles, broadcasts, other material on international issues. And then the following week, we'll be having another online event. That'll be addressed by Madeleine Gleeson from the Caldor Institute of Humanitarian International Refugee Law at UNSW. And she's going to be taking a pretty hard look at the history of Australia's off offshore processing of asylum applications. So do join us for that.
but to round off this evening, I'd like to invite one of our interns, Cameron Smith, to move a vote of thanks. On behalf of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, New South Wales, I would like to thank Ambassador Graham Fletcher for taking the time this evening to talk about China in 2021, the key issues and their significance for Australia. Ambassador Fletcher has made it very clear that China has been a great success story that will be an increasingly important player, uh, partner for Australia in years to come. He also conveyed great insights on the COVID situation in China, the uh, country's combating of climate change and the growing confidence in the country in its economic and political power, as well as some of the issues that might emerge. This talk has generated some great questions from the audience and the ambassador has given some fantastic answers. Questions focused on a variety of topics, such as Afghanistan, China's relationship with Pakistan, water, uh, wealth crackdowns in China, and issues in the Chinese-Australian relationship. Once again, let us extend our thanks to Ambassador Fletcher for your work and for your insightful presentation tonight. Thank, Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, everybody. Good night.